hand. We know that some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Let's sing this together. When all I see is the battle, you see my victory.
give up. Oh my God, so good. You never give up. You never give up on me. Oh, what joy I found because of your love. Because of your love for me. Oh my God, so good. Good morning. So glad you're here this morning. I, I mean, you guys are warriors. You're here, right? I mean, it's a big deal. So I'm glad you're here this morning. I was uh, wondering if I'd be preaching to two people or just my wife, or she'd preach to me, maybe. I don't know. So, uh, so I'm glad you're here this morning. Uh, God has been really gracious. There's a lot of people that are sick. 
uh, that we know in our lives, family, friends, Polk County in general is all sick, so we need to be in prayer for all of those folks uh, and uh, that God would bring healing and restoration and that no one uh, would be hospitalized from that. And so we're going to do that in a moment. Uh, but one, one thing I want to do this morning uh, before we sing a little bit more is I want to invite uh, two really special people. And my, my wife is walking right there. Would you come up here too? You, you thought you were going to escape. Uh, my wife's going to come up here. Ashley and Scott Jones, where are you guys at? Please say you're here. Okay, thank you. I was really nervous because I didn't see you. But uh, uh, Scott and Ashley are going to come up here right now. And then uh, your family is over here. You, you, you guys come this way as well. Um, so, so here's the deal. Many of you may know Scott and Ashley, um, young married couple in our church, uh, super sharp, engaged in our student ministry and many other uh, areas in the church. You serve uh, on the finance team, right? Yes. Finance team? Right now. You paused for a moment, so I didn't know. It'd make, I got nervous. Oh, so. For now, yes. For now, yes, that's right. But uh, Scott and Ashley are moving. When are you leaving? Friday, they're leaving. Uh, they'll be pulling out, and they've kind of consolidated all their stuff. And here, here's what they're doing: they're they're moving to go to Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary. So our Southern Baptist Convention has six seminaries, and Southeastern is one of those. Of course, it's the greatest of all the six seminaries because I got my doctorate there. I'm also a trustee there, so I have to say that. Um, but uh, but that's where they're going, and the reason they're going there is because Scott uh, and Ashley feel the call to full time vocational ministry. Uh, so they are giving up their jobs. And, um, but they're giving up their jobs and they're going to move there and uh, just be equipped and live in poverty like seminary students do for the next couple of years. And uh, it's literally, me and my wife uh, spent several years on seminary campuses. It's the greatest experience of your life. But the reason this is so important to me, and I want, we want to pray and commission them. I know their parents and folks, uh, family do as well, um, because this is what we do. Like, I don't know if you know that or not, but this is what we do. When we're not doing this, we're not doing what we're supposed to do. The church exists to equip its members to become missionaries. In other words, we raise people up to send them out. We don't raise people up to hoard them. We send them out because now what's going to happen is, I don't know what the future holds for Scott and Ashley, but at some point they'll be somewhere, they'll be pastoring churches somewhere, uh, he'll be a pastor at church somewhere, and they'll be discipling people and seeing them grow up in their faith, and they'll go out as well, and then before you know it, our footprint has just gotten that much lar larger. And so I am so grateful that God is still working, that he's not idle, that he is still raising people up and we are still sending people out. And so I pray that one day we might do this every Sunday and you guys might be the first of that, uh, of that tribe. And so I want to pray for you guys. Is that okay? Do you have any special prayer request? Oh. <laughs> um, okay. So s specifically, I think there's a danger with someone like me um, handling the word of God so much that I stop loving it and treasuring it. Sure. as I should, and it becomes kind of my textbook. Yeah. That has been on my heart a lot um, recently, that I would just continue to, to pursue after Jesus, that I would love Jesus as my kind of Lord and Savior, that I, he that doesn't become my professor. Yeah. So you'll have, here's what will happen. So you'll have professors that will tell you this, and this is why it's a joy. If you don't love the Lord as a result of your time at seminary, they all fail. You should love the Lord more as a result of knowing him more through his word. And so I pray that that happens to you guys. Can I pray for you? And you got family here. You guys can gather around. I know you guys have already been around them, so we're not, I guess you're not worried about getting sick. Is that okay? Um, they wanted to come, so I couldn't stop them. God, we pray for Scott and Ashley right now. Uh, God, I thank you so much for just their testimony in our church, their faithfulness and their service in our church. God, really just a willingness to throw their jobs down and just get rid of stuff and can sell their house and move away into a small little apartment on a seminary complex just to be equipped for the next several years and learn as much as they can so that they can go and do what you've called them to do. And so, God, I pray that you would bless them, that you'd bless their move. God, that they would make fast friends. God, that they would love you more as a result of their study and and, um, and looking at your word, God, I pray that you be their family. God, I know there's a little Jones involved, and uh, Lord, I know it's hard for grandparents to, to, to be separated like that, but God, I pray that you give them an extra measure of peace and awareness knowing that they're doing exactly what you called them to do. And so, Lord, I pray that you would bless them, 
God, that you would increase their tribe, that many more people would come after them, willing to give up everything to follow after you. And God, you'll be glorified, we know. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We love you guys so much. Would you stand as we continue to sing together? unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable are his ways who has known the mind of the Lord who has been his counselor who has given a gift to him that he should be repaid 
for all things are from him and through him and to him. To him be the glory forever. Let's sing this together.
everything that is in us I pray we would use as a living sacrifice for you that is holy that is acceptable Lord take this sacrifice of praise and be honored Father as we continue in our worship through your word God anoint our pastor and speak through him God, I pray that your word would be used to stir our hearts, to pierce us, to change us, so that we can say that we surrender everything to you. We love you, Jesus. We pray this in your most worthy name. Amen. Amen. Good morning. If you take your copy of God's word and open it to Exodus 5 and 6, as we'll be... Uh, This morning, I want to read two verses to you, and then we'll pray uh, together. Exodus chapter 5, beginning in verse 1, we pick up where we left off. The Bible says, Later, Moses and Aaron went in and said to Pharaoh, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Let my people go, so that they may hold a festival for me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh responded, Who is the Lord, that I should obey him? By letting Israel go. I don't know the Lord, and besides, I will not let Israel go. God, we love you. Lord, we praise you. Lord, we thank you for this moment. We thank you for the songs we're able to sing together. God, we thank you for what you're doing in our midst, even when it appears sometimes that nothing is happening. God, we know that weekly people are coming to faith in Christ. You are calling people out. You're mobilizing your church and your people to do what you've called us to do. And God, we're thankful for that. And Lord, I pray that this morning as we look at this text, Exodus 5 and 6, God, that we'll be challenged and encouraged from the life of Moses as we see the cross of Christ uh, in your son, Jesus Christ, and how he saves us from our sin. God, that we would know that ultimate deliverance has come in the person and work of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Psalm 90 is one of my favorite psalms in the Psalter. Um, I've got a lot of favorite psalms, but Psalm 90 is certainly at the top of the list. Psalm 90 is the only psalm attributed to Moses. So we know that Psalm 90 was written by Moses. Um, We're almost certain that no other psalm was written by him. But one of the mysteries of Psalm 90 is we're not exactly sure when he wrote it. There's a a bit of speculation about that. Um, I would probably contend based on the, the, the words that are used in Psalm 90 by Moses that he, he wrote that psalm at the end of his life. He, he wrote it perhaps at Nebo. Uh, the Bible tells us that it was at Nebo that Moses would stand on top of the mountain, Mount Nebo, and he would look over into the promised land gazing about what he wouldn't be able to enter into because of the sins of the people. Only Joshua and Caleb and, and their generation, their Uh, their people would inherit the promised land. And so Moses would die there at Nebo. Uh, His bones would be hidden. Um, he uh, he He would later, obviously, the Bible says, by faith inherit the kingdom of God. And we know that we'll see Moses in heaven, but he didn't get to enter into the physical promised land. I I like to believe that it's there at Nebo, Nebo Kazebo, if you will, Uh, that he was looking out and he maybe one morning penned Psalm 90. Psalm 90 has some very interesting words that he wrote down. It starts by telling us in verses 1 and 2, Moses says, The Lord is our refuge in every generation. Before the mountains were born and before you gave birth to the earth and the world, From eternity to eternity, you are God. He would go on to say in the 14th verse, which is about halfway through the 90th Psalm, satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love. And then he would say these words, that we may shout for joy and be glad all of our days. 
Now, those are really odd words. They sound really pretty. There's kind of like a Hallmark kind of card S thing going on there, right? But, but if you think about it, it's a bit, bit strange. Joy every day, gladness every day, that's difficult to even begin to grasp. I mean, a short survey of this room would suggest that there's probably no one that's had joy every day of their life. There's certainly probably not anyone who had gladness every day of their life. As a matter of fact, if you look at the life of Moses, what you'll discover is that his life is not always full of joy, and his life is not always full of gladness, but yet at the end of his journey... Looking back, the Bible says he asked God to satisfy him in such a way with his love that he would have daily joy and daily gladness. How does someone have gladness and joy every day? I mean, we live in a sin sick world. There is sickness, obviously, all around us, there is death, there is chaos. There is family dysfunction, there is relationship issues, there is financial problems, the list goes on and on and on. And so how in the midst of all of that can we have gladness and joy on a daily basis? What I hope that we can see or at least begin to see is while we still will struggle in this life and have moments of anxiety, worry, heartache, fear, that as we grow in relationship with Christ, made available through the Holy Spirit, His indwelling presence in us, that the deeper we grow with Him, the more we can cling to joy and gladness on a daily basis. Exodus 5 is a transition. It's a massive transition in the life of Moses. You may not see it at first, but I'll try to draw it out at the end. It's a major transition in the life of Moses, and it starts very simply The Bible tells us in chapter 4 that as God had met in chapter 3 with Moses in the burning bush, that God had given Moses in his encounter with the living God a decree or a command, and that was to go tell Pharaoh what? What's the famous statement? Let my people go. Uh, It's one of the shortest sermons in the Bible, but that was the sermon that Moses was to preach to Pharaoh And the problem for Moses, as we discover in chapters 3 and 4, is that Moses had some sort of speech issue, and he was fearful to do what was told. He didn't think he was competent or able physically to do what was told, but God said, you don't have an excuse. You can use your brother Aaron. You just need to go and preach that short sermon, let my people go, and I, by my strong hand, will deliver the people. So the promise of God was salvation for the people. Moses was just to be obedient to go to Pharaoh. So we pick up in chapter 5, and it's a pretty simple narrative. Moses appears before Pharaoh with his brother Aaron to preach the sermon. But there's already a problem in verses 1 and 2. Because the end of chapter 4 tells us that Moses and Aaron went to the elders of the Hebrews or the Israelites and they told them that God was going to save his people and the elders, the Bible says, bowed and they worshiped. They were so excited that after 430 years of silence that God was moving. By the way, a clear picture of the coming Christ after 400 years of silence The true and better deliverer of Christ would show up. But nonetheless, 430 years of silence, a a Messiah type of person has shown up saying that God has come to bring salvation. You will go and preach this message. They bow down in worship. And the Bible even tells in chapter 4 that the elders were to go with Moses and Aaron to deal with Pharaoh. But we come to chapter 5 in the first two verses and we find Moses and Aaron in front of Pharaoh, but guess what? There are no elders to be found. Now, this shouldn't shock us, right? This is vintage church-type situation. Everybody's glad to talk about salvation, but when push comes to shove and things get difficult, people scatter really quickly. There's usually just a few left standing. But Moses, nonetheless, is there. The elders have bowed out. They're nowhere to be found. Aaron is there with him to 
help him preach this very short sermon, let my people go, but they run into a man who is obstinate, arrogant, full of himself, and he believes himself to be God. And so when they tell Pharaoh to let my people go, Pharaoh responds and says, who is the Lord? Now, he says that ignorantly, but he also says it pridefully. Who is the Lord that I should let these people go? In other words, he believes himself to be God, so why would he relent to some other thing? So our things are already not working out very well. And Pharaoh decides in that moment, not only am I not going to let Israel go, I'm going to increase their workload. So he brings in the foremen who are... Hebrews, he brings in the taskmasters, he brings in all this kind of hierarchy of, the, of their kind of their working system. He brings them all in and he says, look, here's the deal. You are to tell the people that they are to continue to make brick, but they're not going to be supplied with straw. They have to go get their own straw. But the quota is not going down. They are to produce the same amount of brick each day that they produced before, but now they got to spend time gathering straw every morning to make the brick for themselves. And obviously, everybody knows this isn't going to work out too well, so that's what happens. They aren't meeting quota. The Hebrew foremen are being beaten because they can't get the people to produce the quota. They get a hearing with Pharaoh, and they're like, what's your problem? You're beating us, but you've asked us to do something that's completely unrealistic. And Pharaoh says, and I paraphrase all of this, Pharaoh says, your problem is you're a bunch of lazy slackers, and you just want to go worship your mythical God, and all that is is an excuse. It's idle words. It's deceptive speech. It's not true, but what is true is you're going to keep making bricks for me. It's a no-win situation. So Pharaoh's angry, the people are depressed, being beaten, and now they're mad at Aaron and Moses because they put them in this situation and turned Pharaoh against them even more than before. So the Bible tells at the end of chapter 5 that Aaron and Moses are sitting outside. The people come out after this argument with Pharaoh in which they're is a no-win situation for them, and, and they look at Aaron and Moses, and they say, you've basically made us stink or reek in front of Pharaoh. He wants to kill us now. And so chapter 5 ends with Moses pleading with God in verse 22. So Moses went back to the Lord and asked the Lord, why have you caused trouble for these people? And why did you ever send me? Ever since I went into Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has caused trouble for this people, and you haven't rescued your people at all. Now, if you look at Psalm 90, this is clearly not a situation in which there is joy and gladness all the day long. The people are upset, Moses is upset. Pharaoh is angry. It's a bad situation. But there are a couple of other things going on in the text. Let me just mention a few of them before I make some observations I think might be helpful. One of the things that really sticks out to me, and this is not a point in your outline, just an observation, is what the people do. The Bible tells us that God had promised salvation and deliverance, a better land, if you will. But because the situation got rough, you know what the people did? Now, I want you to listen to me, church, because this is what church does all the time. Because the situation got rough, you know what they began to do? They didn't cling and focus on the promise of God for a better land later. They began to complain and bellyache about wanting yesterday. They said to themselves, remember, yesterday wasn't so bad. We at least got supplied straw. Those were the good old days. If we could just have the good old days back and Moses and Aaron didn't come preaching this whole message of deliverance and salvation, charging us on to a better future, then we'd be okay. And you hear that all the time today, do you not? I mean, there's rarely a week that goes by in a church anywhere where you don't have a group of people belly aching about what used to be. 
The problem with those people is they're not kingdom-minded, they're earthly-minded. Kingdom-minded people know that what used to be wasn't the kingdom. (laughs) What used to be was still in the middle of a sin-cursed world, and what we need is a true and better kingdom. And so that's why they're upset, because they're not focused on the kingdom of God, they're focused on their own kingdom. Moses is upset because Moses thinks because he went and preached a short sermon because God told him to, that instantly after that short sermon, because apparently he did a really good job, maybe he signed his own Bible, I don't know, after he did a really good job, that Pharaoh should have just turned his heart and should have let the people go, even though God said it wasn't going to happen that way. So everybody's all messed up. But then we come to verse 1 of chapter 6, which is profoundly important to the transition of Moses' life, and here's what the Word of God says. But the Lord. And one of the beauties of the Word of God is many times when we come to destructive or depressing or anxious situations, it seems to almost always be followed with, but the Lord. But the Lord replied to Moses, now you will see what... I will do. What I will do to Pharaoh because of the strong hand he will let them go and because of a strong hand he will drive them from this land. Now let me just make a quick statement. Moses is upset. The people are upset. Pharaoh's angry, but that's precisely where God needed them to be in order to move. You see, many of us don't experience the move of God, myself included, because we bring our pride to the table. Even though we know what God has asked us to do, we bring our pride, our abilities, our giftedness, our skill set to the table. And then we're like, why didn't God do something? Well, the reason he didn't do something is because it has nothing to do with what you, what you can do. It has everything to do with what God does. And so now Moses is upset. He's realized that his short sermon didn't work. The people are upset because they realized that Moses and Aaron couldn't do anything. And now they're in a good spot because they're broken. Now God can move forward. Because they're broken, God can say, now you'll see what I will do. And so seven times. God says, I will. He never says Moses will. He never says the people will. He never says Pharaoh will. He always says, I will do this thing. Seven times in the first eight verses of chapter 6. He says, I will do this thing to Pharaoh. It's by my strong hand that they will be delivered. It's by my strong hand that I will drive them from this land. Verse 2, then God spoke to Moses telling him, I am the Lord. There it is again, Yahweh, the great I am. I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as, here it is, as God Almighty. That word there in the Hebrew is El Shaddai. It's not Yahweh. Now, the word Yahweh is revealed to us for the very first time in the canon of Scripture in Genesis 15. So they knew the word Yahweh. It wasn't like they were oblivious, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to the word Yahweh. But they did not know God that way. They only knew him as El Shaddai, God Almighty. But the word Yahweh, the name of God there, is descriptive of what he would do in leading them out of Israel. In other words, all throughout the rest of the Old Testament, as they look back at God bringing the ten plagues, the death of the firstborn as, 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 as the sacrifice was made over the doors and those who didn't do that, the firstborn was cut off from the home. God bringing his atoning work, that's when they would look back and know him as Yahweh, the God who does things. They said Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob did not know God that way, but you will know him personally that way because you're about to see it. This is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they knew El Shaddai, God Almighty, but I was not known to them by my name, the Lord or Yahweh. Verse 4, I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land that they lived in as aliens. Furthermore, I have heard the groaning of Israelites from from the Egyptians are forcing uh, forcing to work as slaves, and I have remembered my covenant. Now, verse 5 is a rehashment of four times he said this, that I have heard and that I have remembered and that I will. So verse 6, here it is. Therefore, seven times he says I will. Therefore, I tell, tell the Israelites, I am the Lord, I am Yahweh. 
I will bring you out from the forced labor of the Egyptians and rescue you from the slavery to them. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm, great acts of judgment. I will take you as my people. I will be your God. You will know that I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of forced labor of the Egyptians. I will bring you to a land that I swore to give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will give it to you as a possession because I am the Lord. Now, let me make a couple of observations. Why can Moses, at the end of his life, say, God, satisfy me with your steadfast love every morning that I may shout for joy and be glad all the day long? Here's why. Because as Moses looked back, he remembered four things specifically. There are probably many many more, but four things from this text specifically that I believe Moses remembered and that we should remember every day of our life if we are to cling to joy and gladness in our life and not get disgruntled like Moses did in this situation or the people of Israel. Here they are. The first thing you need to always remember is this. These are very simple. You need to always remember that God's heart has always been for your salvation. God's heart does not change. His heart is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And his heart has always been for your salvation and deliverance. It's odd to me, and of course it's not odd, odd, because I do the same thing. That God had said that he desired to save his people about four different times to this point, and yet Moses, at the end of things not happening the way that he wanted them to happen, began to complain and saying, what's wrong with you, God? Do you care? Why did you send me? What is going on here? But he had forgotten the heart of God. You see, the heart of God has always been, it will always be to bring deliverance to his people. God desires to save people. God desires that none would perish, but that all would come to repentance in him. This is the essence of the gospel message, is it not? For God so loved the cosmos, it says in the Greek, that he sent his one and only son, that whoever believed in him would not, what, perish, die in their sin, but have everlasting life. God's desire has always been to deliver his people. And here's what God says about salvation. Now, I want you to look at this, but I want you to look at it in light of the cross. It's all a story about Jesus. In verse 6, here's what he says. He says, I will bring you out from the forced labor of the Egyptians and rescue you. Or that word there in the Greek can be, in the Hebrew can be delivered. To deliver you from slavery to them. I will redeem you, verse 7, I will make you my people or my sons and daughters, verse 7. Verse 8, I will give you a land. In other words, what God tells Moses to tell the people is I will bring deliverance or rescue. I will bring redemption. I will provide adoption. And then I will give you an inheritance. Now, that is the gospel message of the New Testament. I mean, it's painted all over every page of the Bible. How does God bring deliverance and rescue? Well, the Apostle Paul said in Galatians 1, 4, that God gave himself for us, that we would be what? Delivered. Delivered from what? Delivered from, here it is, and this is where we all have a problem, delivered from this evil age. Many of us want to live like this is the kingdom of God, and it's not. God has promised salvation. You see, do you see what's happening here in the text, right? God wanted to save them out of Egypt, but they began to grumble and complain even after he had brought them out of why they couldn't remain in Egypt. Many people, because of false teaching or a false understanding of the gospel, think that the gospel exists to give us a better life now. Or maybe some former days that we think were better. But God said, I've come to deliver you and give you salvation from this evil age completely. That there is a new heaven and a new earth, a new kingdom that is coming in which evil does not exist. God has come to bring salvation. That's what the Apostle Paul says. That's what the New Testament teaches. 
You see, what's happening here in the text is, is really a shadow, I call it shadows, of a greater reality of salvation. We have Pharaoh, who is clearly a type of Satan. We have Egypt, who is clearly a type of the world. And we have Moses, who is clearly a type of Christ. God is trying to bring the people out through the deliverer out of the world to give them a better inheritance. I will deliver you. I will rescue you. But then here's what he says. I will redeem you. Redemption runs like a scarlet thread throughout the word of God. It's probably most notably observed in the book of Ruth. Where Boaz is the kinsman what? Redeemer. And he redeems Naomi and Ruth. Why? Because he could. He redeems them because the whole essence of Old Testament redemption is an heir had the ability because they were the heir or a family member or an associate to redeem and buy back that which was desolate or hopeless. Ruth, if you remember, is gleaning on the outskirts. Her mother-in-law, Naomi, is at home, belly aching. They're starving to death. Death is imminent for the two widows. But then... Boaz shows up and redeems them. And they go from hopeless widow, former Moabites who are about to die to people who are on the threshing floor of the landowner with an abundance of whatever they wanted. This is redemption. That not only do I want to save you out, he says in verse 7, I want to redeem you. All that is mine is yours. And here's how you know all that is mine is yours. I will adopt you and make you my sons and daughters. You will be my people, he says in verse 7 and 8. You, are, you, you, you see this in the New Testament, right? Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 8. That you will receive adoption as sons and daughters. And you will have an inheritance, he goes on to say. You will cry out in verse 7, Abba, Father, because you will know your Father. God brings us into his family, and he makes us his children. Deliverance, redemption, adoption, but then inheritance. He says, I'll give you a land, verse 8. I'll give you a possession, a new place, not like Egypt, a, a better place, a place where I will be king over you. But this is exactly what the gospel preaches to us, is it not? In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and following. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to receive an inheritance that is unfading and undefiled, kept in heaven for us. That's what the Bible says. The hope of salvation is that we don't have to live in this evil age much longer, but then one day our Father, our Abba, our kinsman, Redeemer, our Deliverer and Savior will bring us into a new land. So what you must always be mindful of, brothers and sisters, is this. Whatever hardship you're in the middle of, that it may be a hardship, but God, His heart, his desire is for your salvation. I remember growing up, I'm so thankful I grew up in a Christian home. My mom and dad loved me and been married for forever. They're ancient. They're just old. I used to think they were ancient when I was like 16, but now they're really ancient. and They love me, and I remember when I was a little kid, they would punish me or do something or do that or make decisions and as a child what do children do you, you think to yourself my mom and dad must not love me at all they must not care about me but if I was really honest there was a few times I was real honest when I was a kid but not many but there was a few times I was real honest and if I thought about it for a little bit I could never come to the logical conclusion even in the midst of hardship or at least apparent hardship that my parents didn't really love me and that they didn't care for me as a matter of fact, the older I've gotten looking back, I know for certain that there was never a moment in which my parents didn't affectionately care for me and desire the best for me and would have done anything they could to supply for me, care for me, and protect me. 
Now, in the moment, in the fog, there were hard moments, and I thought, maybe my parents don't care for me, or maybe this, or maybe that, but at the end of the day, my parents absolutely love me. And what you and I need to be reminded of in the midst of hardship and affliction and all types of things that we'll go through in this life, what you need to be reminded of every day is that God absolutely loves you, and he desires to save you. But a second truth that you must remember is that Satan wants to destroy you. Now you say, how does that encourage me to join gladness? It absolutely will because it will keep you from doing dumb things. You see, the world is really enticing, inspired by Satan, and we want to go after this and go after that, but what you need to know, the mastermind behind all of that, he wants to destroy you, not give you good things. Even as a Christian, there are six things, I would say, there are six things, and you can see them right here in this book, six things that Satan is always trying to do to you. Now, you're protected and you're sealed by the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 1, verses, uh, verses 13 and 14, we know that. We're under the blood of Christ. We can't lose our salvation. We absolutely know that. But there are still six things that Satan will cause in your life if you'll allow him to and not cling to the gospel of Jesus Christ every day. Here's what they are, six things that he wants to do for you. He wants you to doubt God every day of your life. He wants you to doubt his goodness. He wants you to live in constant fear. He wants you to feel insecure that you're not a child of the king. He wants you to avoid biblical community. Now, I know I'm preaching to the choir because you're all here, but you know exactly what I'm talking about. And he wants you to be led astray. And at the end of the day, last thing I would say is he wants you dead. Now, if you don't believe that, I'm telling you that's a New Testament principle. Spiritual warfare is real, and you actually see it here. In the text before the cross, that's exactly what's happening. He's causing the people to doubt God. He's causing the people to live in fear. He's calling them to feel insecure, to avoid community because they don't want to go out and be a people. They'd rather just stay with the Egyptians and be there and live in the world because apparently it's better there. He wants them to avoid biblical community. He wants them to be led astray. And at the end of the day, if they stay in Egypt long enough, what will happen? They'll be destroyed. Do you see? You see, God desires your salvation, but Satan wants to destroy you. But the third truth is this. Apart from the grace of God, and that's important to say, apart from the grace of God, sinful humanity is rebellious and unbelieving. Apart from the grace of God, every one of us is rebellious and unbelieving. Now, this helps us when we're witnessing to a lost world because a lot of times we come to the lost world and we're like, why don't you get it? Why don't you just, you know, profess Christ in this moment? And it's really all about us in that moment. It's not about the power of the gospel. But if we come in grace, understanding that every one of us, myself included, apart from the grace of God, is rebellious and unbelieving, it'll help us a lot. Is that not what we see in Pharaoh? Because this is the heart of Satan. He's rebellious and unbelieving. He desired to ascend above the throne of God. In Pharaoh, we see it right out of the gate. He says, who is the Lord? And even if I know, and there's a bit of obstinacy and a bit of pride, even if I knew who he was, I still wouldn't let him go because really I'm the Lord. What you need to know about the lost world is this. The unbeliever is ignorant towards God's identity. They don't know who he is. They didn't meet him. They haven't met him yet. The lost world, the unbelieving world is resistant towards God's authority. If there is a God, they sure don't want him telling them what to do. You want to know why? Because just like Pharaoh, every one of us, apart from the grace of God, we want to be the God of our world. We also know that the unbelieving world, just like Pharaoh, is unkind, and that's to say it lightly towards God's community. This is Romans chapter 1. We've seen Romans chapter 1 played out in the news just in the last week. I don't know if you pay much attention to that stuff. But in Romans chapter 1, the Bible continues to say, because the people wanted to do this, God gives them over, and it just gets worse and worse and worse. It's a digression there, and we pick up in verse 18, and God says, he basically says, well, I'll just give them over to their reprobate minds. 
That's because all of us, apart from the grace of God, are rebellious and unbelieving. It shouldn't shock us at all. But we all want to act like we're going to convert the world. But what we really need to do is come humbly to people, understanding that we would be rebellious and we would be unbelieving if it weren't for the grace of God, and graciously preach the gospel to them, knowing that I can't save anyone, but the gospel is the power of salvation to those who will believe. It's God who saves people. And you know what we'll do then? We'll begin to pray for the lost world that we hate so much, or at least we act like it. We'll begin to pray for our brothers and sisters across the street and stop treating them like they're second-class citizens because they're not as righteous as us. Moses would learn in his 40 years that a lot of these people were acting a fool all the time because they hadn't had the same experience that he had had at the burning bush. They weren't up on Sinai when he was getting the law, so they're down there making a golden calf. And he acted out in anger, the wrath of God, the judgment of God is for God to deal out himself, not for us. So when we understand that, we won't let a rebellious, unbelieving world steal our joy and our gladness because we realize that if it weren't for the grace of God, I'd be in the same boat that they're in. But a fourth truth is this. is God's people always move forward in faith. Now, it's interesting to me, and this is my favorite part of the text, and this is where we see this massive transition in Moses' life. Moses went from kind of a borderline defiant character who made all types of excuses to someone who, without the elders who were supposed to be there, was standing before Pharaoh doing what he was supposed to do. He's a man of courage now, but he still has issues because by the time you get to chapter end of chapter 5, he's still complaining to God. So he's got a lot of growing to do. But there is some backbone there now. And here's the deal. As you trace the narrative of Moses, what you'll find out all the way to the top of Nebo is God continues to grow in him as Moses continues to learn to trust God and not himself. In other words, as Moses would learn to relinquish his own abilities and his own power and trust in the God who can, I am, as he would do that, that's when he began to grow in his faith. We talk about faith a lot. We read definitions of faith. For instance, one definition says it's complete trust or confidence in someone or something. Another dictionary said it's strong belief in God or in the doctrines of religion based on spiritual apprehensions rather than proof. But thankfully, we don't have to go to a dictionary to learn the definition of faith because the Bible tells us what it is in Hebrews 11.1. In Hebrews 11.1, it says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And that same chapter, a few verses later, when we get to verse 23 through 28, Eight, it says that Moses was a man of great faith because he, he decided in himself that he would rather face reproach with Christ than have the riches of Egypt. In other words, maybe a working definition of faith could be something like this. This is how I see it. Faith is believing that God is always enough. Therefore, you will follow him regardless of earthly circumstances. In other words, faith is always believing that God is enough. And when things get sideways, it's okay because I'm trusting in God who is enough because he's promised salvation. So Moses continued to grow in this knowledge of God. And that's why he was willing to stand before Pharaoh. That's why he was able to lead the people through the Red Sea. That's why he was able to deal with their obstinance for 40 years in the wilderness and gather manna from the ground and quail from the sky and drink water from a rock because God is enough. 
You know, the Apostle Paul uses a lot of this language, Exodus language, to describe salvation in his writings. For instance, in Romans chapter 6, numerous times, he mentions the reality because Paul was an obstinate person towards the gospel. It's two, two if you don't remember. And he says, all of us were once enslaved. There it is, Exodus language. We were all enslaved to sin, but God rescued us and freed us from sin. He goes on in chapter 7 to say, there are things that I'd like to do, but I have a hard time doing, and things I don't want to do that I find myself doing, but I press on because God has freed me from this slavery of sin. Then in chapter 8, there is therefore no condemnation, no death, no judgment for those who are inside the ark of God, Christ Jesus. Because he recognized that God is bringing salvation. That's why Paul and Silas were singing in the jailhouse one night, round about midnight, after they had been beaten nearly to death and they were in shackles. Not because earthly circumstances were good but rather they had hope and faith in the living God who had promised salvation and inheritance. That's why I think Moses at the end of his life could look back and say, the Lord is our refuge in every generation. Listen to this. This is some good stuff. Before the mountain was born, before you gave birth to the earth and the world, from eternity to eternity, you are God. Let me ask you a question. What is the mountain in your life that's driving you crazy? Whatever it is, whether it's a person with a name or a situation, can I tell you something? Before that mountain was ever born, guess what? God was still God. There was a lot of mountains that Moses would have to deal with in his life. But the one constant that he was always reminded of is that God was faithful and that he was existent before any of this ever happened. And that's why he could say in verse 14, Satisfy me in the morning every day with your love. Why? Because when I'm satisfied with your love, when when I'm satisfied with the hope of salvation, you know what I can do? I can shout for joy and be glad every day. There are many in this room right now that you lack joy and you lack gladness. And it's not because God is not faithful. It's because you are so focused on this world. And you're not focused on the kingdom of God. And you've forgotten who God is. And it's stealing your joy. Brothers and sisters, We need to lay those mountains at the feet of the cross and recognize that God has promised salvation, redemption, adoption, and oh, by the way, an inheritance in heaven for us. He says, one day I will rescue you from this evil age and I'll make all things new to the glory of God the Father. God, we love you. And Lord, we thank you for the hope of salvation. God, I ask in this moment right now, That for anyone in this room who doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, maybe they're saying, just like Pharaoh, who is the Lord? Oh, God, I pray through through your spirit, God, that you would work and move in their heart and in their life. And God, that they would know you, that you would draw them to their side and they would be saved. That they would confess with their mouth that you are Lord this morning. And that today would be the day of salvation, that they would know you and be saved. God, for many others in this room who are stuck in some situation, we're complaining about the past. God, I pray that our eyes will be so fixed on the salvation that you offer us, the coming kingdom of God. God, it will be so fixed on that and that we cling to it with such aggressive faith that we would have joy and gladness knowing that regardless of what comes tomorrow, we've been saved by your grace. Lord, we pray that this morning would just be a moment in which we acknowledge that you are a strong, eternally existent, loving, gracious God who 
who provided a way for us to be saved through your son, Jesus Christ, who did everything that the children of Israel could never do, who lived a sinless, perfect life, died on a cross for our sin, but you didn't stay dead, Lord. You came back to life, and you promised to come again and rescue your church. God, I pray that we would love you accordingly. You are worthy of it all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand as we sing together?
Thank you for joining us for today's message. If you'd like to watch other messages like this one, we'd love for you to visit our website, golakeschurch.com, or download our Lakes Church app. Either one of these will provide you with tons of information, things like the option to connect with us so we can get to know you better, or if you have a prayer need, you can let us know so we can pray for you. You can also give online so that we can continue doing what God has called us to do for His kingdom. And of course, if you'd like to see even more, then visit any of our social media platforms from Facebook to YouTube and Instagram. Well, that wraps up today's message. We hope you have an amazing day and we'll see you next time.